Good morning. Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer as we prepare to study his word. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and praise you for another chance to learn more about the truth uh, that lies within scripture. We pray all this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, we're jogging through James. We're jogging through James in the midst of all that is taking place in our culture from COVID till civil civil unrest. And we find the words befitting for us today in James chapter 19, James chapter 1, excuse me, James chapter 1, uh, verses 19 through 21. Uh, James chapter 1, uh, verses 19 through 21. Wherever you are in your living room, at home, those of you that are here with us in the sacred space of the sanctuary, can you stand with us? Uh, for the reading of God's word and acknowledgement of his reverence. Uh, James chapter 1, if you're physically able to do so, wherever you're listening, uh, if it is socially appropriate for you to do so, please stand and we're going to read uh, those three verses for your hearing. Uh, James 1, 19 through 21, reading as is our custom from the English Standard Version of the Bible. Here's what it says. Uh, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Amen. You may be seated. Stop the violence. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere. Stop the violence. Uh, people are dying all around us. Uh, however, I speak not in stress, not here physical death, but spiritual, and I dare say social death. Uh, this is caused by verbal communication that assassinates the character of others. And for many of us, this includes family, friends, and even other fellow followers of Jesus Christ. Question. What's the root of this behavior? I believe it is a denial of God's goodness, of which James is a purported uh, uh, fir affirms in James 1, verses 13, 16 through 18. And then frustration with life trials and temptations that James deals with in James 1, 2 through 15. These are the symptoms that instigate the assault, the verbal assault that we often attack one another with. The Apostle James knows this to be true, so he combats these shortcomings with words of wisdom. These words are found in the verses we just read, chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. He is revolutionary in his theory. He says to us, put down your tongue and raise your ears. This is done to offset human tendency to react in anger. And his message wants us to know that this is not the way of God's people. You know, the sages were right. When they said God gave us two ears and one mouth. So uh, listen as twice as much as you talk. Let's get to it. What's the point of the sermon? What's the sermon in the sentence? What's the thesis of the message? Here it is. God's strength empowers our restraint. Hmm, I'll say it again. 
God's strength empowers our restraint. Uh, I have power to overcome my emotions through Christ, and you can be emotionally balanced even when mentally overwhelmed. Here's the tension of the sermon. Is God's strength weakened by humans' weaknesses? I hope, I hope the answer, answer is obvious to you. It, it is no, God's strength is not weakened by our weaknesses. It is actually illuminated it in us because when we are weak, he is strong. There's two cries, uh, Ricky, that shows God's strength empowers our restraint. Two cries, first cry, is to reject godless ways. Stay with me. We must reject godless ways. Uh, the second cry takes place, and the second and final cry takes place in James chapter 1, verse, verse number 21. It is to receive God's word. We reject godless ways. We receive God's word. Let, 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 let's just begin the study. Here's the first cry. It is to reject godless ways. It is seen to us in verses 19 and 20. May I read it again for your hearing? It says, know this, my beloved brother. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, because the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. There are two tears that come from this cry. One tear is manu manufactured through affection and the, the other tear that is produced from the pen of the apostle James as writing to his ori original e e readers is prompt from the tear of action. Listen to this notion of affection, this term of endearment uh, the Apostle James uses uh, this morning to address his readers. He says, know uh, this, my beloved brother. And that's it right there. Uh, there's no deep, hidden, fancy meaning taking place in these terms. He, he just gives us a subtle glimpse into his apostolic heart. Uh, the Apostle James was a caring pastor. He had a pastoral heart, and he understands that he is about to give them some stern instructions, and he does not want them to feel his firm hand without sensing his tender heart of love. He, he wants to be dominating as well as delicate at the same time. He, he wants them to understand that his emphasis here is on knowledge. He says, you're my beloved brethren, or, or to be fair in his translation, my beloved brethren and sisters in Jesus Christ. He is speaking to the community of faith. He is saying to them, I, I want you to know. This is another aspect of a pastoral heart. Godly pastoral leadership understands that our joy, our hope, our faith, and fortitude is based off of knowing. Our inspiration is rooted in information. It, 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 it's something wrong if you can jump high doing the singing and fall asleep doing the sermon. You, you need some information to empower your inspiration. When you got information and your inspiration is weak, guess what you do? You tap into that information and it, it builds and revives and rejuvenates your inspiration. When, when your joy is weak, just remember he's your shepherd. You have no, you shall not want. That's information, but that gives me inspiration to say, if I know he's my shepherd, I'm inspired to have no wants. This leads to the action. This is the other tier 
that is produced from this cry, the other tear that is produced from his cry. These are actions he wanted them to beware of. Listen to the apostle. He goes from saying, know this, my beloved brethren, to saying, let every person be quick to hear. Slow. <laughs> to speak, slow to anger. Here's why. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. There's three actions there. Uh, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. There is a connection in all three, but the first two has the strongest connection. The reason is, and I want to look at those together, the, the notion that every person be quick to hear and slow to speak. The reason you can't is because you cannot be quick to hear unless you are slow to speak, and if you are quick to speak, you will not be able to be slow to hear. <laughs> See, the causation is due to correlation. The relationship between hearing and speaking means effective listening can only be done when hearing is suspended and there's tall, attentive ears is placed on the one who is speaking. Hearing supersedes speaking. Skip all that. Let me just say it like this. I was trying to be formal and educated here. Let me just say it like I want to say it. We need to shut up sometimes. Because the only way we can empathize with others is to first hear from where they're coming from. Our words, friends, can either heal or harm others. We have to be calculated with them. Proverbs uh, 15 and 1 uh, helps us with this, Tracy. It says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. Can we have a moment of honesty for a second? Can we, uh, uh, can we admit that many of the arguments we get in, we love to blame the other person. We love to blame the spouse, the co-worker, the neighbor, the friend. But can we be honest that most of it is stemmed from the fact that we never hear one another. We spend most of our time talking at one another and then we finally conclude when we're tired of talking you may have had a point. <laughs> the violence that's in our land stem from a deadly ammunition of our tongue. This is what the Apostle James is talking about. We'll look at it, James chapter 3, verses 5 and 10. Let's meet him mid-argument. He says, the tongue, watch this, Ronald, is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a force is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set apart from our members. Sustain it, it stains the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and it's by hell that is set on fire. We've tamed every type of beast, James said. We we got birds that the, the, the fly a certain way. Beasts uh, that go into cages, reptiles and sea creatures can be tamed but can't nobody tame their tongue. It is a deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and with the same tongue we curse the people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. Just look at me and look holy. Won't nobody know we're talking about you. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. And James says that ought not be so. What a critical topic. Is it not in light of the civil unrest in our nation? What an appropriate time in light of the clashing that is taking place in our home amongst family and marriages because we are now forced to be home and sheltered. There, there is nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. What th This is appropriate to us because it ministers to us in a unique way. By taking responsibility 
off the plate of the villains as we name them be it racial or in the intimacy of the family structure, be it professional in the workplace, be it social with your homeboys and homegirls. Takes the responsibility of our said victims and say to us, be quick to hear, slow to speak. But guess what, y'all? He got more. Slow to anger. Is a call against anger. James says the anger of us, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness that God requires of his species. And yet you know the Bible had a lot to say about this emotion. Uh, Proverbs, uh, excuse me, uh, Psalm 37 and 8 says, Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. Proverbs 14 and 29 says, Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but who, who has, is hastily tempered exalts folly. Uh, Ephesians 4 and 31 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put put along put away from you along with malice ecclesiastes 7 and 9 says be not quick in your spirit to become angry for anger lodges in the bosom of fools i ain't call you no fool the bible said that uh, proverbs 19 and 11 says good sense makes one slow to anger and its glory is in the, there is glory in overlooking an offense then Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, hold on to this. We'll come back here. It says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give an opportunity to the devil. Devil. And then the master teacher, Jesus himself, says in Matthew 5 and 22, but I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother is liable to the judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the counsel. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Uh, the survey results are in. The word of God is clear. Anger is a bad thing. The emphasis here is not that we will not get angry. If you misinterpret what I'm saying, you may get angry for me saying not to be angry. That, 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 that's, not, that's not what James is getting at. James is telling us we all get angry, frustrated. James says your anger cannot control us. We, you cannot discipline your child when your emotions are angry. Take a second, cool off, and then let those feelings subside, and then see what the decision making of discipline and means is. There, but I need to note here, there is a need for righteous indignation. In fact, something is deeply marred in your sanctification if you see racism, senseless killings, hateful rhetoric from self-proclaimed righteous politicians, and so on, and still are not evoke a holy zeal inside of you. There, there ought to be some anger in you when you see a world that is more and more decaying and slipping away from everything that presents itself as of God. However, that anger should lead to self-evaluation. Selflessness in giving to righteous cause. Humility in speech in godly discipline. Holy zeal leads to a deeper commitment to God. Human zeal leads to a deeper commitment to self. For our anger does not produce the righteousness that God requires. Righteous anger does lead to a push for change spiritually and socially. This means the church ought to have anger to change the body, but also the community, the city, and country in which we live. Raise up 
Christians with holy anger to call that which is right, right, and wrong, wrong. I'll press on. I stress this, Ricky, because people will bully us into thinking that we ought not have nothing of passion to say because we are meek, humble Christians. But not my Jesus. My Jesus would throw over tables and whip people out the temple. My Jesus would call folks hypocrites and busy bugs and, and demons when he saw that things were wrong. There is a such thing and an appropriate thing as holy zeal. Let's move on. Reject godly, godless ways, but also receive God's word. That's verse number 21. This is a life verse. It's a verse that you and I should know by heart. If not, know by heart very close to it. He says, therefore, put away all filthiness in, in rampant wickedness. <laughs> <laughs> and receive with meekness the the implanted word. I love that. The implanted word that is able to save your soul. Did you see what happened there? It's a taking off and putting on there. Two movements there. In verse number 21, the first half, he tells us what to take off. And, and, and then in the second half, he tells us what to put on in light of taking something off. Here it is. Therefore, put away, take off all filthiness and rapid wickedness. The command is to put away. It is preceded by the word therefore, leaving us to answer this question. What is the therefore, therefore? It is prescriptive in nature. The call is to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, and it induce these following instructions. See, see uh, uh, the previous verse told us what we ought to do. Now this verse tells us how we ought to do it. This is what we have to do in church. Is That's what discipleship looks like. We just don't tell people to do stuff without showing them how to do it. And, and the thing you got to do is first clean out the closet. You got to put away filthiness and rampant wickedness. Come on now, you know what that means. When you got company coming over the house, you put away filthiness and rampant wickedness. You, you know what that means when you got somebody special riding in the car with you. You put away filthiness and rampant wickedness. You, you, you know how it is when you're going to go somewhere that's high dining and fancy. You know, the concerts you used to go to uh, pre-COVID-19. You put away the filthiness and, and rapid wickedness and you... Uh, Adore yourself in a certain way. And James says, before you put on something nice, you got to take off that dirty stuff. Note the graphic terminology that he uses here. He, he describes Susan seeing as filthy, and, and it consists of rampant wickedness. Apostle John helps illuminate this in 1 John chapter 3, verse number 12. When he brings up the evil of Cain, he wrote, we should not be like Cain who was the, of, of the evil one and, and murdered his brothers and uh, his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Did you get that? Uh, Cain's evil was induced by the fact that he was filthy and Abel was clean. This displays, watch this, Benita, the sinfulness of sin. And James says to us, take it off. Paul helps us with this further in Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 10. He demands that we put to death, therefore, what is earthly in us. He says, put it to death. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, 
which is idolatry. On these, on this account, on one on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these two, you once walked when you were living in them, but you must now put them away. You got more anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self in its practices and put on the new self, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of your creator. God didn't just save you to go to heaven in a bye-bye. He saved you to be better in a now and now. You got to put it to death. You can't knock it out. You got to put it to death. You can't put it in a coma. You got to put it to death. You can't lay it to the side because you're going to church for 15 to 30 minutes or an hour. You got to put it to death. You're taking that off, but what are you putting on? Watch the progression here. It is beautiful. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. Please understand, you cannot receive God's word if you don't have meekness first. Remember James 1 and 5? You remember how he literally presented that notion of wisdom to us? If anyone lacks wisdom, James is not suggesting there in his presentation that there are some of us that have wisdom and some of us that don't lack wisdom. James is trying to get us to see if you don't think, if you don't realize that you lack wisdom, God can't help you. But if you know you lack wisdom, you can ask God for it. Before you get wisdom from God, you got to first know you need wisdom from God. Listen to Proverbs 3, 5 through 8. We quote it all the time. We race out over a significant portion of, again, another life verse. Life verses. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, but don't rush this. Do not lean to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. He will make your path straight. Watch this. Be not wise in your own eyes. I love it because teaching his son wisdom in his children wisdom, Solomon says, you can't really trust God if you trust in yourself. <laughs> you can't turn away from evil if you don't realize that you can't be wise in your own eyes. That's crazy because what, 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 what the wisdom literature is saying to us there is smart people are stupid. <laughs> or those who consider themselves smart are actually stupid. This is one of the joys, I dare say, of this pandemic. It, it, it exposes our vulnerability, does it not? It shows how susceptible we are. Uh, no, no matter how many push-ups you do, no, no, no matter how much you work out or, 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 or don't eat meat, or all this other stuff, it doesn't matter. You still need a mask and social distancing because the body is prone to illness, sickness, virus, and everything else. And if this don't take you out, something going to take you out. And then he switches the emphasis to God's word, receive with meekness. You're bringing this in. This is what you're putting on. You're putting on meekness for you can receive this implanted word. I love how a uh, Hebrew writer described it uh, in Hebrews chapter 4, Malika verses 12 and 13. He says, for the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It, it's Charmaine piercing to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and and intents of the heart that and, and all creature will no creature will be hidden from his sight all are naked and exposed to whom they must give account that means God's word will read you more than you read the word of God there's a correlation to God's word with the previous command to put away all filthiness and rapid wickedness because a dirty life will produce a clean Bible. Either the Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible. Brothers and sisters, it's his word that helps sustain us. And I'm afraid, 
and I'm done here. I'm afraid we're not hearing each other. A failure to hear one another eliminates the notion of empathy. Empathy is eliminated when you are not listening to one another. We all have our agendas and, and platforms and they are spewing at other people that have their own agendas and platforms, their uh, biases, uh, be they informed or unform, informed, uh, be they intentional or, or non-intentional, be they are uh, conscious or, or unconscious, or, but whatever the case may be, if there's going to be progress in the church, not the world, we must be. Quick to hear. Slow to speak. I'm done. You need something? Slow to anger. Ain't he all right? For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. And receive with meekness the implanted word that's able to save your soul. That save your soul there is not just speaking of eternal salvation, but sanctification for the believer. It can make you better. Let's pray that God will help us. Father, in the name of Jesus, we realize that we are weak. And we're grateful for that. Because when we are weak, you are, you are strong. Help us know better or know to do better. It's for Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.